what's the jumping in point for the audience? It takes place in the same world as the film, but we build on it and we really carry on. You don't have to have seen the film to enjoy the movie, the show, but if you have, there are a ton of Easter eggs and it's really expanding that world. Yeah, and, I, and what I think the, one of the great things about it is, you know, the last act of the of the film, you have sort of Samantha Morton and, and Tom Cruise working together in this this precog, and you didn't really get to sort of see the precog um, humanity of the precog in the movie, and I think that's something that the, the yeah. series does really well. In the movie, the precogs are obviously the center of pre crime, but they're the kind of computer at the heart of it. He liberates the one Agatha. And we're taking the tack of, well, what would it be like to be a precog, post pre crime, still having these visions, but trying to act on them on your own, live in the world? Uh, so it's kind of a fun take on that. It's very character driven. It also feels like that it's not cool to be a precog, like you're not supposed to be a part of that anymore. They're, they're, they live in secret. They have to live in anonymity. After pre crime ended at the end of the film, there's that amazing shot uh, in, the, in the film that kind of pulls out of their cabin where these three characters who were almost like walking fetuses who had no, had no life other than living in the milk bath now have to learn to be human. And, uh, and, and you know, watching that, I thought that was, that was the moment where it clicked and, and then we came, started talking about, about well, what happens next? You know, what happens if you're one of those three people uh, who's haunted by that now has to live secretly and yet you, you see murders do you just run away or do you try to engage, do you try to act? And then there's the fun of what's it like to be someone who's preternaturally a genius but has absolutely no so social skills because you were never raised with people. Yeah. And what's fun, what, what Vega's character, Megan Good's character, uh, has to team with Stark's character, who is a precog, but in the movie there was an infrastructure in place, there was due process and, and you could arrest somebody. These two have to team up without any type of judicial infrastructure and kind of stop crimes in the margins without also being detected. So it's a great challenge for them, not to mention the writers on the show to come up with this and keep it going. So and then so another, the other huge part in the fun challenge for us is thinking, okay, yes, that plus it's 50 years from now. Oh, that, yes. you know, and and, there, and, and the fun yeah. that the movie had with it. We had, we're in that, we following that legacy. We have to be thinking about that in terms of everything. You know, you can't just have a cell phone. You have to think, what's that next iteration of communication? You can't just kill somebody with a gun. You know, there's lightsabers available. <laughs> but Damn, you've given it away. <laughs> and that's what makes the procedural really interesting, because procedures have gotten really stayed now. To be able to play with that future tech and future crime, so you can have unpredictable and surprising twists in the, in the procedural stories, that's what's great about it. Yeah, we don't start with a dead body. We start with, there's somebody who's going to die in 36 hours. How do we stop it? Um, without leaving too many fingerprints. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's sort of that reverse of the of the traditional detective genre. Uh, yeah. What were some of the challenges in trying to create it for television? Like, versus the movie, everybody knows. Well, I mean, skill, I mean, production, first of all, scope and visual effects and all that, and how do you, you know, I've worked for Steven for 20 years, this is the first uh, film that he directed that we're making as a television show, and he kept all of us up at nights at like, okay, well, you want to sort of do it justice, but you have television money. We had great money from Fox, but it's, you know, how you sort of do those production tricks to make it look as big of, as a movie when you have television money. Well, we had a great visual effects company named Coast Effects, which did great, great um, production designer and DP and, and director that sort of gave it that cinematic look. And it's come so far that you can just, yeah, you can achieve that now on television. You see it all the time. It's just, it's, it has that kind of epic scope, but the ability to dig deeper and really live with these characters uh, going forward and explore some of those themes that the movie was able to only touch on because the precogs were the sort of they were the system, they were the computer of pre-crime, uh, and, and everyone remembers Samantha Morton from that film, uh, but now the ability to live with that longer and explore that world more so that we can, we can uh, do the things they did ten years later and given what the technology has become. So, from touch screens that, that we saw in that film and now the gestural interfaces from the film, now we can evolve that into three-dimensional space. What's it like when you have retinal interfaces? What's it like, you know, we have and, and the effects that we've been able to sort of bring in to realize that have been really exciting. I see two trends in procedurals right now. Odd couple procedurals like Sleepy Hollow, yourself, um, or Lucifer. 
and then I see movie continuations like Limitless, Rush Hour, you guys again. How do you differentiate between, or how do you stand out in, in this trend? Hmm. Well, that's a good question because Max and I want to resist the automatic forced romantic coupling. These that could go down and happen down the road, but it but it's not something we're set set not to do. We want them to be an odd couple and follow the logic of it. He's precog. He hasn't he hasn't dated. He may be a virgin. We don't know. She's she's a cop and teaming them together and seeing what would happen. We're trying to make it realistic. They're gonna have fun together. We're gonna it's a lot of humor in the show. So we'll we'll end up going there with it. But it's not I think it's a fresh take on the couple because it's not a forced thing to it. It comes from the uh, can you talk about? Sorry, go ahead. No, I was I was nodding in affirmation. Okay. <laughs> Can you talk about the cast and what they bring to the role? I, I, the cast is really exceptional. We put together an amazing cast. Uh, the, the the role of Star uh, that Stark stands plays Dash, one of the precogs. Uh, that who's really a, uh, kind of our initial point of view character as a precog, uh, is an incredibly difficult role because you've got someone, who you have to portray this person who's an adult human living in the world, living in a world in the future, who spent the first 15, 18 years of his life essentially a vegetable hooked up to a machine and now he's come out and his desire to connect with people is uh, it meets the impediment of the fact that he can see murders and some the people the murders of the people around him for it happens uh, and so the complexity of that role is insane uh, and he does it with charm and it's really amazing and Megan Good balancing that out as this shrewd kind of hard driving detective who has a sort of her own sort of haunted kind of history that she's seeking to sort of. Uh, get beyond, uh, and the two of them working together and redeeming each other has been amazing. And then Laura Regan and uh, Agatha and Wilmer Valderrama, uh, which is the, the most charming guy you will ever meet. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. And, 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 yeah. and Laura has this sort of ethereal, uh, maternal quality to her that's just amazing when you see it in the pilot. And, you know, hard sort of hard role to follow up from Samantha Morton. You know, yeah. she does a pretty awesome job at it. So. How do you balance the case of the week with the rest of the... Yeah. Uh, that's a good question, and it really for us it's really important to be able to have that balance. I mean, my favorite shows really achieve that in a way where you we have, we're blessed with this amazing story engine of someone who sees murders before they happen, uh, and but falling into it where it just becomes a uh, kind of cookie cutter formula is the opposite of what we want to do. Uh, but at the same at, at the same time, that drive is such a great drive to bring these people together each week. But as you know, we've been talking about we have this rich backstory. Uh, where the film is a piece of that, and we get to explore uh, both what came before, uh, much of their own history, the Precog's own history that they're unaware of, and the fact that they're living in anonymity and secretly and need to stay below the radar so as not to be taken advantage of by potentially even more nefarious people than simply the pre-crime program that held them before means that these guys, uh, there's, there's you know, like a rich mine of material for a serialized story that we're going to be starting from, from the get-go and obviously continuing to build as you start to get to know these characters. How influential and how involved is Steven Spielberg also in the look of the show? Very much. Nice. So very much, yeah. He's very, I mean, um, he doesn't put his name on any show that he doesn't get intimately involved with. And on this, you know, the director, Mark Milek, who we hired and worked with as a United States of Terror and the DP, David Franco, who's on Game of Thrones, Stephen knew his work, and the uh, production designer. So in every aspect of it, and in fact, like two days after he finished shooting BFG, he was in a room with these guys. Yeah, and giving it pitching them out <laughs> story arcs for the whole season and then giving notes on props on literally props. like oh why don't you do this with the gun or do yeah. this with the set decoration so he gets really involved he says it's a, the favorite part of his day you know, is to do that kind of stuff and, not, not too shabby for our day either yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty good part of the day exactly yeah. pretty cool did you guys learn anything working with Steven? no no, no. I, I would say he's, he's learned a lot about know. Know. <laughs> no, but even the little things that he told I mean like the murder visions is a perfect example yeah. of that yes. like you know it took them a long time to find how to shoot the murder visions for the movie when we were thinking about doing it we were originally going to go one direction and it didn't work and he gave us a lot of good tips on sort of how to do it so that it would work he basically said hire the guy
guys that exactly. we used in the movie. Right. <laughs> so the murder visions which yeah. Yeah. are the ones from the movie. Yeah. So but he's able to read, the same thing he was able to like read a, read a scene. I mean, he must, you know, he read a scene in the script and said, "Here's how you should do that." And I still have that email. I don't know, I can frame it. <laughs> Even the gestural interfaces and stuff. I mean, one of the key things when they have the things on the screens is like, we can't just have people doing this and that unless they know what they're doing because later when you put it in, it won't work. So it's just those little things that you wouldn't know if you hadn't gone through the whole movie process. So it's it's invaluable to all of us. And, you, and we call it sprinkling the pixie dust. It's yeah. the pixie dust, and we'll take as much of it as we can get. You know. Yeah. You don't get enough. I wish we had more. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good luck with the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, excuse my